Sorry to keep you waiting. Complicated business. Complicated. I've just received a call from Secretary Clinton. So all Republicans and Democrats and independents across this nation, I say it is time for us to come together as one united people. I pledge to every citizen of our land that I will be president for all Americans. Working together, we will begin the urgent task of rebuilding our nation and renewing the American dream. America will no longer settle for anything less than the best. Reclaim our country's destiny and dream big and bold and daring. We have to do that. We're going to dream of things for our country and beautiful things and successful things once again. Boy, find three people in Washington who thought that was going to happen. You can't. Story of the century. Good evening and welcome to a special edition of Tucker Carlson Tonight, the show that is the sworn enemy of lying, pomposity, smugness, and groupthink, none of which you will see tonight. We're going to dive into the first hundred days of the Donald Trump presidency. Perhaps no issue has been as big for him during the campaign and for this country as immigration. Here's a look back at how he says he planned to deal with that issue if elected president. On day one, we will begin working on an impenetrable, physical, tall, powerful, beautiful southern border wall. Two million people, criminal aliens. We will begin moving them out day one, as soon as I take office, day one. Homeland Security and the Department of Justice to begin a comprehensive review of these cases in order to develop a list of regions and countries from which immigration must be suspended until proven and effective vetting mechanisms can be put in place. I call it extreme vetting, right? Extreme vetting. Well, joining us now for the hour, as Larry King used to say, Jessica Tarloff, a Democratic strategist, Charlie Hurt with The Washington Times, the star of The Washington Times, honestly, <laughs> and Molly Hemingway of The Federalist. It's great to see you all. Yeah. I'm just going to start in this order and then jump in. Uh, Molly Hemingway, there's no question, I think, just to those of us who watched from afar this campaign unfold, immigration at the center of it. Trump made a lot of pretty specific promises on the subject. Does he have to keep them? Well, I think that a lot of people said that Donald Trump didn't care a lot about issues during this campaign. Right. He actually did care a lot about issues, and immigration was one of those topics that yeah. he hit early, and it was a big reason why he got support early on, and there is a there's a big desire for people to work on this issue. Now, is he going to deport 12 million people? I would say no, right. but you get a lot of understanding about where he's going with his nomination of Jeff Sessions. There's a lot that can be done simply through enforcing the laws that are on the books. At and DOJ, at Justice Department. Yes, yeah. uh, uh, Jeff Sessions as Attorney General, and Jeff Sessions is a very much a law and order guy. He very much believes that the laws on the books should be enforced, and there's a lot of room for getting a lot done just that way. Um, so I think that that's probably the best indicator right. of, of what's going to happen. Personality is policy. That's absolutely right. The wall, Charlie, the wall. Yeah. I'm one of the rare people who lives here. I didn't, I didn't mock the wall. I think the wall makes a lot yeah. of sense. Are we going to get a wall? No, and, and, and you know, everybody has walls. There are walls everywhere. And there's supposed to be walls. And there are walls. There, there, the, the, uh, you know, the, 19, uh, the 2006, I think it was, uh, Fence Act that both Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama voted for, yeah. that, that's uh, essentially you know, the wall that, that he was so ridiculed for. And I think that a, a big reason why um, Trump was such a surprise here is because he did pick immigration. And immigration is something that both, you know, Democrats have been, you know, for open borders for a long time now. Um, and even Democrats, I mean, Republicans had sort of started to become in favor of open borders. They'd been sort of jeered into the corner thinking that, oh, my gosh, I'm a racist if I don't support open borders. And so that it, he kind of took both parties by surprise. Oh, and, then, sure. and then all the people, like, jumped in behind it. To answer your question about what, whether we get a wall or not, I, I don't know whether we're going to have a physical Great Wall of China. <laughs> along the southern border with a big, fat, beautiful door. But um, I think that if, you, if he simply enforces the laws that are currently on the books and uh, gets, deports you know, people who have committed crimes beyond that, 
uh, and and does something about you know controlling uh, stopping the the ongoing flow into the country, I think you do that much, and you are like 80 percent. Sol have solved the problem, yeah. and I think that a lot of pressure comes off of not only uh, of him in terms of keeping his wall promise, but also in terms of what happens to the remainder, the remaining um, illegal aliens who are here otherwise obeying the law. Or right. Working. So w once you don't feel overwhelmed, yeah. you can make rational decisions. Yeah. Jessica, I have a promise I'm not going to pick on you for the hour. We don't, we don't agree on this issue. Only like I, 57 minutes. Oh, 50, 58 <laughs> in that range. Um, she can handle What's the argument against a wall? I know everyone's like, oh, the wall, the wall. But like, what is the rational, since you're a rational person, what is the argument against a wall? I actually don't think there is much of an argument against a wall. I think that Democrats always should have had you know, a kind of piecemeal, but in one approach, which is we'll secure the border, whether you're going to do that physically or with border agents. I mean, the Gang of Eight bill had, I think it was 20,000 border agents, which was right. more than Donald Trump was proposing. I don't think Democrats are actually against this. I think that they get scared, first of all, about keeping Latino votes. Right. right, which I mean, this election has kind of upended that block <laughs> voting uh, rule. So we're going to see where that goes in the future. Um, and I think that they just wanted to oppose Republicans largely. Right. So we have a net flow out of Mexican immigrants at this point. I mean, we had a million less than we did two years ago, I believe it is. And we're going to see where, where we go with this. But I think Donald Trump can be really smart about this, and he can put more border agents there. I don't know if you're going to be able to build a wall or if you can put in more fencing. But if you put more agents in, and then you also start talking about the fact that you understand that the vast majority of these illegal immigrants who are here are hardworking, genuine people who just want a better life, and talk about a pathway to citizenship, I don't know what language he has to use, but over 60% of Americans favor that. I mean, that's where it's interesting. I mean, the Trump base build the wall, build the wall, lock her up, all of that kind of stuff. But the country isn't there, and now he's the president for all Americans. You could solve this problem, like, tomorrow if you crack down on employers hiring people who are not here legally, it seems to me. There's but, a lot of pressure not to do that. The, the, the pressure from both parties. That's, I mean, well, the from the Republicans, right. really, on that question. Yeah. I mean, it really is and, a chamber of commerce. And, the, and, and what's, the only people that don't have a chamber or don't have a lobbyists uh, working on their behalf in that whole argument are American workers. Right. Who, no, that, that's totally right. Yeah. Chef. Okay, there so major moves from President-elect Donald Trump inviting some unexpected people to join his cabinet. So how does the Trump administration stack up so far? Here to break it down is Republican strategist and Fox News contributor Tony Sayag. Always good to have you here, Tony. Happy, Happy Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving to you. Abby. Great to be with you. Thanks. All right. So it's, it's stacking up here. At first, you were saying, where's the diversity? Now, as of yesterday, yeah. you've got two more women. Sure. Nikki Haley, great pick. I think very happy conservatives in this country today to see their darling, someone who they've been looking at since 2010 as a rising star, get such a high-profile diplomatic post. i got to talk about Betsy DeVos. This is a real exciting pick, especially to those committed to the charter school and school choice movement. She is a reformer. She's not someone who's mm -hmm. going to go into that bureaucracy, sit there and accept the status quo. That's why you're getting a lot of the resistance from the left. But this was a terrific pick. Again, a lot of happy, not just conservatives, this has been an issue, both sides, particularly uh, members of African-American clergy, people who want to see revitalized inner cities have, have supported the idea of school, and, uh, school choice and charters. Uh, and then you go down this list. Look, I think the picks of Ryan's Priebus and Steve Bannon was a brilliant positioning. You have Ryan's Priebus, hmm. understands Washington, RNC but chair. There's been a lot of criticism, well, uh, at least from Steve Bannon's perspective. And, and a lot of it's been, frankly, unfounded and manufactured by the left, who just don't like the fact that Steve Steve Bannon, both through Breitbart and through the Trump campaign, has outmaneuvered right. them. Steve Bannon represents that kind of outsider populist you know, mm -hmm. finger on the pulse that I think this White House will need to stay true to form. Well, now, as we love to do in media, we love to speculate. <laughs> Who is going to be next, right? So Secretary of State is arguably the biggest. Walk us through who's going to take some of these big positions. Absolutely. But one last thing i got to say. I mean, anyone who doubted Donald Trump's commitment to really reforming immigration uh, this should not because Jeff Sessions, Jeff Sessions has been an outstanding pick and I think will do an amazing job as Attorney General. The speculation about Secretary of State, I think, is garnering the most attention between Governor Mitt Romney and former Mayor Rudy Giuliani. Now, look. One loyal to him, one not so loyal. Pre precise. <laughs> and if you look back to Abraham, Lincoln team of rivals. You know, there's always this kind of precedent where you bring people who haven't necessarily supported your agenda Who's into the administration. This is a tough pick. I think this will tell us a lot. If he picks Mitt Romney, it will clearly show that he's in governing mode. He wants to mm -hmm. unify the party, unify the country, and Romney would be a, ter a terrific representative of our country around the world. Rudy is one of the closest advisors to Donald Trump. He's strong. Mm -hmm. He's robust. He knows the president well. This would send a clear message, obviously, that the Secretary of State has the ear, not just the well, 
well, office. And maybe there's some names the we're branch. not even talking about that they are speculating about. You never know. There could be some surprises that come and, out of And I've thing. been a fan of, of your father, uh, Governor John Huntsman, oh, who also was a big uh, envoy to All China. All right, a spitfire here with the rest of these. Sure. So, look, Steve uh, Mnuchin is the leading candidate for Treasury Secretary. Okay. Goldman Sachs, he's also been a Hollywood producer, close friend of Donald Trump, his finance chair. But there's been another. Rick Perry as well has been talked about for energy. Yeah, Rick Which Perry. I kind of, and I love Rick Perry, but I love that because that was the one that he couldn't remember in the debate. Remember the three E's? Yeah, I mean, you don't want to, you don't want to necessarily replicate that performance. Here's why I like Perry for energy. Governor of Texas, energy state, during the first term of Barack Obama, 20% of the jobs created in this country were in Texas and largely energy related. Energy secretary should not be an academic, should not be a theoretician. It should be someone who knows how to help create jobs, particularly in the energy sector. And here's a big one, defense. Uh, Mad Dog Mattis is, is how many the military call him. Yes, and so many people are universally excited. This is the pres uh, the uh, commander of our uh, military overseas during the Obama administration that was stopped short. You know, President Obama was thought to maybe not like some of the real pragmatic right. recommendations. You know, he was viewing the Iraq and Afghan theater more ideologically. So if you give right. Mattis a chance, he picks up where he left off. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. More speculation. Great to see you. All right. And another Fox News alert. U.S. officials confirming an American service member has been killed in northern Syria. Syria, this is after suffering injuries from an IED blast. It is the first American casualty in Syria since the U.S. joined the fight against ISIS. Joining me now with more on this, we have Carl Higby. He's a former U.S. Navy SEAL and author of Enemies, Foreign and Domestic. Carl, thanks so much Thank you. for being here with us this morning. Does this underscore how dangerous it is for our military uh, over there, even if they're in those advisory positions? And should this a change our role and mission in Syria? Well, this should not. It should have been changed from the beginning. And, and it does underscore how dangerous it is. When you put a small number of troops in a, in a generally hostile area, we don't have the support network to maintain our own security safety. And we ended up overworking ourselves to maintain that ourselves. Now, uh, with this whole thing, what, what we're seeing is Whereas the Obama administration largely doesn't understand the threat. I mean, there's half a dozen or so factions there. You have Assad, you have ISIS, you have Kurds, you have the rebels, you have uh, Turkey, you have I uh, Iran through via Russia, and then you have us. We need to define a goal, and we don't know what that is yet. We're just there. Convoluted indeed, as you just highlighted all the, the factors and various variables, if you will, and that's right. the key. That there's so many variables, so many un unpredict unpredictable aspects of this war. How do you think it will change under uh, President Trump? Well, I think uh, Trump is, is seen to have better relations with Russia than uh, obviously our current president. And what we need to do is, you know, Russia is bombing the rebels because that's where ISIS came from. They were in the rebels when we armed them. They took the things and now they started fighting the Kurds. So it's a whole mess over there. I think Trump and Putin need to get on the same page here, find out who the actual enemy is, define a measure of success that's going to be stable for both us and them, and then execute that mission together. So you mentioned Putin. Do you think Russia would be more cooperative uh, under a President Trump? And do you think that President Trump would be okay with Assad staying in power? Well, I think. That's a tough question, and quite frankly, it's above my pay grade. But I think that Trump and Putin have seemed to get along a lot better than this current administration. But the big thing here is we have to define what is going to be best for that nation. The last time we overthrew a dictator, which was Saddam, we had a mass chaos. If we do overthrow Assad, we may have to commit to 100 years of occupation, which is the American public but ready But you for don't him. think uh, Putin would stand for that, overthrowing Assad? I mean, he's been saying all along right. that he, he, you know, he supports Assad staying right. in power. He's been bombing the rebels. Now, we've failed to recognize that the rebels that we're arming, are some of them are becoming ISIS. So we need to get on that same page. So. Once we do, we can figure out an end state. We don't, nobody right now, if you ask any admiral general, nobody has an end state to this war. We're just indiscriminately bombing certain targets here and there. We need to find out what's going to solve this war and what is the definition of success there. Welcome back. Well, President-elect Donald Trump has already filled some high posts in his administration, but he still has some hard choices to make for his cabinet. Here to break down the positions that still need to be filled is Republican strategist and Fox News contributor Tony Stayeg. Good to see you, Tony. Hey, good to see you, Abby. All right, so let's start with what we know so far, the picks that he's made. Sure. So I actually think this is a great decision right here. He's made some decisive choices early on to show the type of direction he's going to appoint the administration. Ryan's Priebus as chief of staff is interesting because he understands Washington. The critique of 
President-elect Trump and his group is that they're outsiders. Reince could help navigate that, but it's important that he has Steve Bannon in there. He's Steve, had a lot of criticism. He, a lot of it unfounded, a lot of it fabricated. Look, Steve Bannon has beat the elite media through Breitbart, and he beat them through uh, helping wage the Trump campaign. I think he clearly has the target on his back, but a lot of that is unsubstantiated stuff. But yeah. Bannon represents that outsider kind of populist touch that the Trump White House has to maintain in order to stay true to its message. I think Jeff Sessions, outstanding mm -hmm. pick, one of the earliest supporters. They're like a Flynn people. Of Donald Trump. Trump, exactly. Same with Mike Pompeo. And then two women at the end, Nikki Haley and Betsy DeVos. Betsy DeVos is, is an interesting pick because she truly is one of the biggest leaders in the country mm -hmm. for school choice. And this is yeah. something that Donald Trump has made central to his kind of picks. It's actually one of the more dynamic picks I think uh, he could have made for this position, emphasizing that that is going to be a top priority for the administration. And well, Nikki Haley getting a high-profile post. Look, she's been a conservative yeah. darling. I think this was she did not necessarily endorse him early on in the process. This is a very good way for him to show the Republican Party that he's going to include right, a lot well, of people. Let's look ahead because everyone's now speculating about the, the, the positions that he's not picked yet. Most importantly, Secretary of State. And there seems to be uh, some conflict going on behind closed doors about who that person's going to be. Yeah, and there's no doubt that loyalists to the Trump campaign, people who have supported uh, President elect Trump from the start, want Rudy Giuliani or at least see Giuliani as a much more natural pick since he was so outspoken and so strong. His credentials, by the way, are outstanding mayor of New York City. He's understood kind of world terrorism, global events better than most people. He would be a terrific choice. By Flip Mitt Romney does not seem as conventional because of the harsh criticism he offered President-elect Trump. But the reality is he is somebody, again, with a lot of prestige around the world, and it would send a very interesting and dynamic message if Donald Trump were to pick him. I will remind, our, okay, I'll remind our viewers real quick, though. George H.W. Bush and Ronald Reagan were bitter political enemies. George H.W. Bush called Reagan economics voodoo economics when they were political rivals. There is a time for Healing in a political coalition, and I think Robbie President -elect said Trump some pretty nasty things about Mr. Trump and his character. So I can understand why yeah. some of his oh. Wilson family members are are struggling with this. Totally one. understandable. The question is, who is best for these jobs? Politics Correct. aside, well, these are big positions. Homeland uh, Security Secretary. Look, I think you know uh, Congressman McCall, who chairs that committee right now in Congress, is a very natural pick. Uh, he's somebody who I think has been outspoken during the Obama administration, sometimes being a little bit more, more lax in the view of many conservatives on the issue. He strikes me as natural. Look, I know a lot of people think Rudy's a natural for that, too, but I think Rudy Giuliani clearly uh, deserves something uh, along the line of Secretary of State in the eyes of those who are loyal to him. But you're absolutely right, Abby, and only Donald Trump and Mike Pence know, you do need to pick the best person for the job. Yeah, well, the speculation continues. Tony Zago, it's good to have you here. Great to be with you guys. Thanks. Thanks. We want to check in now with our pal Geraldo Rivera, and when he was on this program a few days back and all but endorsed Mitt Romney for Secretary of State, I warned him it might might be the kiss of death. And Geraldo, uh, happy Thanksgiving. We have new information this morning. A senior transition official telling me that there are conversations going on about whether Mitt Romney has to issue some sort of a public apology to Donald Trump for some of those nasty comments months ago if he wants to become Secretary of State. What do you think about that? I think it's gracious. It's Thanksgiving time. Why not? I mean, the words were very harsh that Governor Romney uttered in the heat of the campaign. I don't think uh, people would fault him if he said, listen, this is all about, uh, that was about uh, electoral politics and I had a different preference. Now we're all on the same team. We're all patriots. We want the best for the United States. I still think that Mitt Romney would be a superb choice as, uh, as Secretary of State. I also think that General David Petraeus, a man I've known for an awfully long time, uh, you know, he had, a, he had some right. problems recently, but I met him when he was two star oh, and he wait. entered Baghdad with the 101st Airborne, mm -hmm. then three stars, four stars, then director of the CIA. But, He'd also be terrific, but I hope Governor Romney very publicly says to President-elect Trump, listen, uh, you know, uh, hot stuff was said by a lot of people. Let's, uh, let's get past it for yeah, the best of the country. I want to challenge you on that because I think that, I don't know, I don't buy it, first of all. That's just my personal opinion. I, I don't buy it. I think that they want this public apology. They're not going to really offer them the job. Why would you ask for them to issue a public apology? Can't they just go behind closed doors, shake hands, say, look, we had our differences. Here's what we're going to work through as a businessman. And now this is, you know, this is a new frontier. Why do you have to make him write a letter and put it out there publicly? It sounds like he's groveling, making him grovel for this job. The, the charges, the statements, and the you're a fraud and all the rest of it was so very public. Mm -hmm. I think the apology has to meet 
uh, you know, uh, it has to be in kind. It, you know, mm -hmm. it, was, it, was a, it was a big blow, a body blow in public. The apology should be similar, I think, in scope. And when you, I think, I think more substantively, look what you're looking at. You have the, uh, the Petraeus Romney moderates, as opposed to John Bolton and Newt Gingrich and Rudy Giuliani and others who I think would be exactly the wrong message, even though I know them all and, uh, and have great respect for them. They're, they're flamethrowers, and I don't think the Trump administration in formation needs flamethrowers right now. We need solid citizens, respected worldwide, with uh, tremendous experience, without, uh, you know, uh, making money like Giuliani did overseas or, you know, some of the, uh, you know, Bolton, the problem he had when he was trying to get confirmed for the U.N. ambassador job. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just really think that this is the kind of message, and I understand how people are ticked off because he's a moderate and he, he's not part of the, of, the, uh, of the Trump ethos that was mm -hmm. presented during the campaign. But so what? We're past that now. We're all on the same team. That's the way I see it anyway. All right. Well, speaking of a feud that's going on, the DNC is now facing a class action lawsuit from Bernie Sanders, of all people, his supporters, rather. Do they have a case is the question, Geraldo. I mean, there's been so much talk for years about how the Republican Party has been so divided. They can't figure out where they stand. And here you have the Democrats and you know, the progressive wing, the Sanders supporters. They saw what came out of those WikiLeaks, right? They know behind closed doors that, that the DNC was not wanting Bernie Sanders to be their nominee. How is this going to play out? You know, Abby, I, I, I think that the Democrats are in such total disarray that I, I think they are the, you know, we all had family, uh, you know, debates yesterday about politics and so forth. I think the, the Democratic Party as a family was so totally dysfunctional that they'd be better off just to, like, uh, just lay low for a while, you know, go, lick their wounds and then get their act together. To me, the most significant thing in, in your question, particularly, you mentioned WikiLeaks and how uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz was, uh, was laid low by the WikiLeaks. To me, that's the biggest untold story mm. and one that we'll get to, the, the uh, impact that WikiLeaks and was it the Russian intelligence had on our electoral process. Uh, you know, this time it was the Democrats who got beat up by WikiLeaks and by the Russians, presumably. Next time it could be the Republicans. Our entire election affected in a way that was, I think, underreported and very substantial. I think we've got to really stop those leaks. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to really address our cybersecurity. And I want President-elect Trump, and it seems like he, he totally gets it, to address what I consider an existential crisis. If we're not safe on the Internet uh, with our country, then uh, nothing yeah. is safe. Well, Geraldo, we didn't have to use surveillance. We asked you politely to offer some photos, and you were very <laughs> uh, generous. Uh, how did your Thanksgiving go with family? It was terrific. I'm out here in, in Cleveland with my, my in-laws, with uh, Jerry and Nancy. We, we love it here in uh, Northeast Ohio, a hotly contested uh, <laughs> presidential battleground uh, uh, here in Ohio. Ohio, of course, going for, uh, going for Donald Trump. But uh, even though we had our political discussions, it was terrific. Everybody sat there uh, uh, and politely gave their points of view. Uh, we watched a lot of football. You mentioned Florence Henderson. I just want to say Why do I have uh, a hard time to believing that one? There were a lot of I know. It was great. It was great. I, I, I just want to say hi to Florence Henderson, the RIP, wonderful, yeah. wonderful lady yeah. on Dancing with the Stars. And watching football yesterday, what reminded me of it, uh, Antonio Brown of the Pittsburgh Steelers, a great uh, other colleague on Dancing with the Stars. He was great yesterday. Uh, he caught a bunch of touchdown passes, and uh, we had fun. It was wonderful. It's a great well, part good. of the country, and uh, we had a lot of fun. Miss you guys, but well, nice seeing you. Miss you, Geraldo. Happy Thanksgiving to you, you and too. thanks for joining us on this Black Friday. Thank you, and your family. Thanks, Geraldo.